Okay, so we'll start. So um, thank you all for turning up and for all those who are out there online. Um, so the objective today is to give you a, a quick overview, really, of what we're going to do, of the outcomes of this FRDC project. So that's the title of the full, the full project, Understanding the Value Provided, value provided to Fisheries by Man-Made Aquaculture Structures, FRDC project, which was supposed, I think, was going to run for 12 months or something, and we ended up, because of extension of COVID, going for like two and a half or something, or a year, and much more anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but what I'm going to focus on is the economics component, and this is joint with Johanna, who unfortunately is somewhere up north, sitting on a beach, I think, pretending to be doing work. But um, <laughs> she, no, that's not way of doing work. Uh, unfortunately, you can't be. Oh, come on. You don't want to move on. That's interesting. See, when I said that it was all going so well at 5 2, <laughs> and surely nothing can probably get, possibly go wrong. It's uh, okay. Thank you. I have to hit it five times. So, very briefly, introduce the team who was involved, the whole team. So, it was led by Ewan Harvey, uh, myself, and Johanna, who were the economics bit out of UWA. Um, there was then Julian Clifton and Carmen Elric Barr, who are uh, human geographers from UWA, um, and Fran Ackerman and Geordie Hill out of the business school over in Curtin. Um, so that was sort of, I suppose, the core team, and we were, there was sort of this, uh, definitely an economic component with myself and Johanna, and, and then there was sort of what we termed the social component, which was Julian, Carmen, and Fran, and Georgie, um, led by Ewan, and there was also an, an el some elements of um, ecological, um, bi biological components as well. Uh, and then there was what I sort of turned up in the lower slide, there was also a, a, a broader team of people involved um, out of Wamsey, so Julian, I know she's into Julian and Luke and so on, Jenny Shaw, who's done a lot of work on um, policy side of this, and particularly one of draw attention to Paul McLeod, who was not part of sort of the initial team, but was came in and was doing some uh, particular chunks of work. Um, so Paul's ex-dean of the business school here, now a consultant, and does a lot of work on fisheries. Uh, and I'll be flagging um, where Paul was particularly involved. So it was a, a big group, big team, lots of um, interesting issues in terms of putting all this together. So very quickly in terms of the overall project objectives, um, trying to identify augment integrate methods to identify small social economic values, as in what we meant by social economic values was a very interesting starting point for the whole thing. Um, they wanted a list of all the man-made marine structures that existed in WA. Uh, we were supposed to collect and collate altogether information about the social economic values for um, and using particularly four case uh, five case studies. Started off with four, I think it ended up at five, um, and then something which came out of um, one of our funders whose name has just disappeared out of the back of my head, things we'd see, how can I possibly, anyway, um, that will come back in, in a second or two, who particularly wanted to get uh, some guidance. So when they're particularly looking at decommissioning of oil and gas infrastructure, they wanted some guidance as to how they should go about doing this valuation process. So they didn't just want to see a massive great big report. Um, Chevron, thank you, uh, has come, my brain has clicked back in. Chevron particularly wanted to have some some guidance that they could give to their different departments as to what well, if you're going to be involved in decommissioning um, these man-made objects in water, as in uh, what should you do in terms of trying to get uh, identified values? What we mean by man-made marine structures, yeah, anything made in the water um, and sort of we got started to edge up the coast in terms of things like boat ramps and so on. Um, but, but we weren't interested in natural reefs, for example. Uh, it's got to be, we, it's got to be human uh, created. What are the sets of, of issues that the, the uh, end users that might be interested in this? Well, it's anything to do with recreation, anything to do with tourism, um, anything to do with um, commercial. And I suppose, well, we didn't, we weren't trying to put values on these things from the perspective of oil and gas, as in what's the value of a bit of oil and gas pipeline as an oil and gas pipeline, but it's, at the end of its life, 
what could it be, have value for elsewhere for these groups? Um, so that's the nature. Okay, a number of structures, just very briefly. So this was Ewan stuff that he was doing their objective too. They went off and mapped the whole lot. There's about seven and a half thousand of these things sitting out there in the waters of WA. They've got a beautiful um, interface where if you want to, you can go and, and find what's where and by different sort of pathways as in shipwrecks, boat rounds and so on. Um, hopefully they've got a complete catalog of where those things are. But it's just like a, a measurement of what it is um, and, where, uh, and where it sits. So that's sort of the scale of things. And obviously we can't and haven't tried to address the issue of, okay, what's the value of all of those things? That's just, well, you could, if you wanted to just take the number and multiply by 7,400, but, um, but we wanted to take sort of more of a case study approach to it. So this is sort of a, the, a big overview picture as to what the process was Starting in the middle, we had this objective. We wanted to work out what the socioeconomic values were. There was this sort of joint work that was going on basically by uh, Hannah, Carmen, and uh, Georgie did a big lit review for everything they could find on anything to do with human values associated with these, this stuff in the water. So that informed the first stage. And then it sort of went out to the next level. You can see it sort of there's these three components went through. Johanna and I doing stuff on the economic values, then Fran and George are doing social value group. What that means is that their work was, was particularly um, surveying and interviewing people in groups and getting groups together and asking them about what their issues. So it's sort of a focus group and deep process. Julian and Carmen's work on the other social value approach individual um, was about surveying individuals and asking what their values were without any that sort of interaction, which, which Fran and George did. So there's an element in which we sort of went out and into our separate little pods, but there was a lot of interaction and integration as we were going. Um, so a lot of the survey work that we were doing for the with Julian and Carmen, uh, we were using the same surveys, just different questions inside them, and we were sort of trying to get that integration happening early on. And then at the end, there's an attempt to try to get integration as to what have we found from these three different approaches. We're all talking about the same thing, essentially talking to the same people. Um, to what extent can we pull that together? Okay, but we're going to talk about a third of this, um, not the other two thirds. Um, we're just going to talk about what we did from our economic component. So, what was our objectives? Well, economic values of MMS. We want to look at different contexts, so the case studies. We want to think about different stakeholder groups, as in wreck fishers, wreck divers. Um, commercial fisheries. We wanted to get, um, at the start, we had this grand plan that we're going to try to look at different economic techniques with different complexity, with the idea of, of sort of being able to give advice in terms of saying to somebody who might, else might want to do this to say, well, you could do this quick and dirty approach and this is what you'll get out of it, or you could invest a lot more money and this is what you'll get out of it. Um, and these are the benefits of doing that. So we deliberately went for a, a range of different approaches. And we sort of had this idea we're going to assess the benefits and shortcomings. I don't know how well we've done that. We make some comments about how well we've done that or what the, um, but I'm not going to claim that we've done a sort of a definitive statement of what the benefits and um, shortcomings are of the different techniques, but we started to think about. What are our five case studies? Um, Chosen those just so that you could then afterwards do some benefit transfer for to the other similar ones or not? No, actually, the, they, they sort of came because they were coming from the there's a big um, a steering committee group with a whole different series of different people involved. Um, so they, they were coming because there was interest from, from various directions. Something like Bottles and Jesse was added on later on because there was a, an emerging interest in sort of these unique physical items. Uh, but in, so that was really the choice. It's, a lot of it is actually driven by oil and gas decommissioning, but not completely, as in terms of the source of some of this material. But we'll, I'll go through and show you what, say what the things are. So Echo Yodel is one is, a, is some offshore pipeline uh, which connects up some bits of infrastructure. Um, it just looks, it's actually quite a small bit of pipeline. 
every time they tell me how wide the pipe is, I always think, man, is that all we're talking about? It's sort of centimeters. It's not like you, it's not visually like meters huge, big pipes running about. It's quite small. Um, <laughs> 12, inch. 12 inch, thank you. Um, which sort of, that's not it, but, um, but it's, it's a small bit of pipe, right? And it's connected. Up. And the interesting that is it's, it's way offshore. It's not going to be accessible for diving or for wreck fishing. Um, it's, it's, the interest there was on the commercial fishing uh, fishers who potentially were targeting it because uh, fish accumulate on it. So that was the first one. Uh, Thethernard is some oil and gas infrastructure, which um, is going to need to be decommissioned. There's these um, a whole series of stuff above water and below water. So that is close enough. That's got various elements. It's close enough that potentially people can get out there to fish or dive if it was left in place, but also it could be the source material for moving stuff. Navy piers in Exmouth is actually run by the Navy. Uh, it, there's a one commercial operator who's allowed to take people, divers in to get onto it. So it's an interesting icon. I believe that is a picture of somebody meeting something on the Navy pier. Um, so it's sort of a really high, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an iconic, um, Bit of infrastructure sitting there. It's an interesting one in the sense that it's, it's really clearly controlled. King Reef is an artificial reef that's been put off Exmouth, created with oil and gas infrastructure, but it's basically the idea that of trying to create this new artificial reef, which was just about in place when we started the project. So what's the value of doing that? And then Bustleton Jetty, you know, that unique piece of infrastructure. Um, what's the value of, of, of that? So that's all the context. Okay, the lit review. Surprisingly small numbers of papers coming out, which actually deal with this man-made stuff. Um, so lots of, if you just look at values of diving or the values of, of, of reefs or whatever, there'll be masses, but when you actually try to drill down into something which is man-made, um, seems to be much less, which sort of surprised us. Um, and it's sort of mostly about use values, Divers, wreck fishes, commercial fishing, um, nothing on non use. So, um, yeah, didn't there seemed to be a gap. So, it's a good project in that sense. So, what I'm now going to do is whip through very fast, giving you almost no information about what we did to try to look at those. So, this is like a cook's tour, basically, of just what the issue was, how it went about it, what sort of the numbers came out were. Um, so, King Reef, Exmouth, it was just starting up. Um, we essentially used a benefit transfer technique. Um, this was done with Paul McLeod, and it was sort of based on and used some of the analysis that Paul and Bob Lindner had done on a big review of the economic value of, um, of recreational fishing in WA, which got a lot of headline um, and interest. And so we basically sort of picked up th that approach with Paul and applied it to this, this reef. It's, there wasn't enough activity going on that we could have sort of done a full survey. So this is a form of sort of a benefit transfer that we're using to try to put it across. So we want to just use whatever information we could find, which we could relate and apply to this picking reef. Um, and we're focusing basically just on the wreck fishers. There seems to be, there might be some diving going on in it, but we didn't deal with that. It's just so what do we need to do this? We need to know something about the ecology, what's happening in terms of the biomass. Ewan was helpful in that. Um, we need to know something about quality of activity that might be going on. So can we predict some sort of change in catch rate? We essentially made that number up. Um, we need some information about how behavior would change as a result of, of that going into place. Um, so we need to sort of predict to some extent what the increase in use is or the increase in the the benefit as a result of having that. There's a bit of information about how many people are using it, but they've sort of made that up. Um, and then we're going to drive out of this some sort of information about economic sur surpluses and expenditures. Um, oh, I should have been hitting those because that was all the hands of animations of more fish going in and more boats appearing. Um, so it, it could improve the quality of experience or it could actually increase the amount of activity. Um, that's I thought was a good different one. So um, baseline sort of numbers that we're getting out, assuming what our assumptions are. Um, well, for the region as a whole, this using Paul's sort of um, setup and structure, 
the, the value of the fishing activity up there, the consumer surplus bit area above um, the prices, um, demand curve 3.8, expenditure about 10.3 million a year. By putting in that clean reef, we're looking, we think we're looking at you know, 100 to 300,000 in consumer surplus, possibly up to a million. Um, okay, there's the figure that would be better coming beforehand. What's the basis for doing this? Well, we've got some idea as to what the total trips are into that region and what the expenditure is, which is the work that Paul has done before with Bob. Um, that gives us point B, there's a dot on there. Uh, scour the literature to find elasticities of demand for wreck fishing. That gives us a, a, a slope at that point. We extrapolate it out. Um, and we made on this version, um, made an assumption as to what the improvement in the quality of the fishing activity would be that shift the line. Obviously, you can see lines not to scale, because that's going from 1176 to one, but just so you can see it. Um, and then we just work out areas under, under curves, as in what's the increase in consumer surface for those who are already fishing, what's the extra bit in terms of people who are brought in, and so on. So it's, it, it's using minimal information as to the best of our ability, particularly at a point when we can't actually do any direct surveys because we, we, we were, they were barely starting to, to use it at the point, and then COVID anyway. Okay, so COVID had an interesting impact for us. Um, Oh, and that's been just repeating that. Okay, so then we had another one, the Navy Pier one. How did, so that's it for Kings. This is this, this is the speed in which you're going to see these case studies. Okay, <laughs> so just to, to let you know what's coming. Um, so this is uh, Navy Pier. This is this sort of unique bit of infrastructure. Um, we got access in and, and to the company and they who were running it, and they let us or they they distributed a survey for us out to all their the previous users of it, so we could get us a user. Uh, survey. We estimated a zonal travel cost model. So this is one where we try to identify frequency of trips um, and then try to explain that frequency based upon um, sort of uh, access rates by population. Um, so for that, we have this online survey of, their, of the peer visitors. We know they're all divers. We know their travel costs. We know their frequency of trips into the region. Um, you estimate James isn't here. Good. Uh, <laughs> these these zonal travel cost models end up with these really small data um, data um, points. So there are six observations because we have these six zones of being WA, Australia, US, Europe, Oceania. I think were the ones. Um, so you, you're basically trying to fit a line through six data points and infer something. But it's based upon lots of the of, of responses from the from the individuals, but. It's basically fitting that demand curve. Uh, it's a, um, a Poisson model, which just lets us pick up the fact that we've um, that the, the, the trip counts. We it worked best with the inverse of the travel cost. So the travel cost coefficient is positive, but actually it's it's the inverse. It's negative. Um, and what you can end up doing is you sort of infer this demand curve as to what would happen to, to the visits if we started to have some sort of entry fees, quote, that we would squeeze people out of visiting. So basically you're working out the area under the demand curve, it's a consumer surplus measure again, if, if you could, you know, artificially introduce this speed. Um, so you can see, um, oh, must have, mm, okay, so up it goes. Um, What's the value then of Navy Pier? Um, there was the business revenues is quite straightforward because you can work out what the expenditures, but the consumer surplus bit is the, is the bit on top. So it's why is that line that's used? Because we are taking different segments in and out of the market. They hit a they hit a threshold point and we lose a, an entire segment of the market at a particular price. So they they come in. What did you go? Okay, so we can get a value for, the, for, for, for that Navy Pier for that particular value. But it is, it's obviously an unusual one in the sense it, it has apparently, according to people who like going into the water, as in really amazing, um, it's like one of the bucket list type places you should go and dive. Are those business revenues and consumer surface additive? Yes. It's, it's sort of the bit below the line, as in, as in just what it, you, you know you're measuring from turning mm -hmm. up. And the consumer, okay, is it additive? Well, we, we should be measuring, ideally be measuring profits yeah. of the business activity. Yeah. 
But uh, what everybody wants to know, the, the headline number which people run around really want to talk about is how much spend is going on in the region? And you sort of say, no, but that's not right. It should be this very small marginal profit. You should be, oh no, we want to know what's the amount of volume of spend that's going on in the region? Sure. Jobs or jobs, yes, the other one. And what does this mean in terms of jobs? So yeah, with the poor one, I said, the poor one, um, the well, the bottom, yes. Yeah, so uh, without multipliers, so Paul McLeod was very negative about multipliers, saying he doesn't like including those in this type of analysis because you can, everybody knows they're rubbery and gets. So. Bustles and Jetty, another single site. So this is a unique object here. Again, we did have the plan we were going to have somebody down there serving people at the end of the jetty couldn't do that. So in the end, we had to get them to distribute it to their users, to their friends group and uh, through their Facebook. So it's not a, per, you know, these are not perfect ways of doing this. I mean, there are constraints in terms of what we can do. Um, so in the end, we got two, about 200 people who actually responded to the survey. Because of COVID. Because of COVID. I think it'd be much nicer to, to have done a more systematic survey of everybody going down there. We'd have got a, we could, have, we could have said that we've got a representative sample of visitors to, we were planning to do it at weekends and weekdays and after hours and so on. So we could have, but um, we were just, um, 195 censored negative binomial model because in the survey, some people 40% said they visited more than 50 times. So it's not a proper count. It's a, so we had to account for that. Um, what you, what you end up in this model, you end up with a travel cost coefficient. Yeah, it's negative, as in the thing that you really want, as in, so we asked them about where they'd come from and what they, the costs were of getting there. So we could do the classic thing. Of, we expect to see people who are living close of visiting more. So the people who are going 50 times a week are people who presumably are living close, as in they're 50 times a year. They're, they're getting in easily, cheaply. There are other people, say, coming out of Perth, who might do it once a year because they're on holiday or whatever. Um, so you can get this travel cost um, coefficient, and then you can just take the inverse of that. It gives you the measure value of a trip. Um, $36 for the consumer service for trip. You can, and you start to see some relativities coming up now, as in Bustles and Jetty is not as valuable in terms of consumer service as Navy Pier. Is that surprising? No. Is it quite nice that the relativity are turned? Yeah, it's sort of a bit of an internal sort of check. Um, but we're getting some idea about what the value of it as, and then there's the business revenues one. Uh, I've forgotten how many people you can divide 19.3 million by 36 to work out. They told us what they thought their annual visitation rate was. Is that half a million anyway. Um, <coughs> half a million visitors. Hmm? Were there any negative values involved? No, because people are implicitly people are turning up and they are um, getting benefit pleasure from. Perhaps they didn't have pleasure when they got to the end of the mile long jetty and they had to walk back again. <laughs> but we're assuming that a visit there is positive. Um, then, uh, so this is an interesting one where we could have done more because there are there are the elements apparently of conflict happen on some of these things. So. Uh, conflicts between the wreck fishers and the divers, as in the divers don't like having people dropping hooks and weights down on them with it. And there's some sort of issues in there, which, um, so that would have been interesting to have unpacked, but we didn't get the chance to do that. Okay. Um, use values, multiple sites. So this was going to be initially the central part of what we were going to do. And at the very start, we had this plan that what we were going to do was have an app, actually. We we're going to give to rep fishers in particular, take out on their boats. It would track where they were going and they would fill in what they were catching and so on. And we had a, there was sort of an agreement we were going to get that, that set up. That sort of fell over. Um, I'm not quite sure where that negotiation failed. So then we said, OK, we're going to do a whole series of boat ramp surveys. And we'll get people to fill in and we'll ask them where they've gone and visited and what they were catching and all the rest of it. And then COVID hit, so that fell over. So we've ended up with this one, just having a, uh, an online survey that was put out through uh, Wreckfish West uh, to all of their users and through uh, gear shops, diving shops um, and so on, just saying, will you please come and, and take part in this survey? quite a large um, 
prize what are drawn um, out of them to induce them to come in. And essentially what we asked them to do was um, identify where they, by putting dots on maps in culture survey, as in just dropping on where it was that they had gone fishing. It was the last three trips and they could put three destinations in each of the trips because obviously you have multiple points to go there. So again, not perfect. And the diver numbers are pretty small um, because it was hard to get access to them. But it is what we've got, it's what we've got. So it, for this one, this is more about the principle as to what you could do if you could get a really nice, rich, big data set on from divers or fishers. And um, they told us, tell us where they go. And ideally, if they could tell us what they were expecting to catch and do all the detailed stuff that you would get out of a proper boat ramp survey in terms of, but we haven't got that. We've got much more limited information. We've got it for four regions, Geograph Bay in the south, Coral Bay up north, Exmouth, and Onslow. Onslow is where the uh, Tethernard um, infrastructure is. So this is an example just of the heat map um, as to where people are um, in terms of where they're going. The heat maps are a bit misleading in the sense that the heat maps are just telling us proportional where it's going, not absolute. So obviously the fishers, we've got more of them than the divers. Um, but the but the colored dots look just as significant and important for the divers, but they're not in terms of numerically. Um, just in terms of making inference as to where they're going, we think about a third of them are on some sort of man-made structure. Um, this is the Geograph Bay one. Two thirds for the divers are on. That's not surprising. But what do you do with this? Well, you estimate a random utility model, a site choice model. Where have they where have they chosen to go to go? out of all the possible places they could have gone and we basically put a grid across that and allocate them into a grid so we're going from a sort of continuous description spatial description of data to a, a discrete version they drop themselves into a grid and then we describe something about the grid and the, what we use to describe the grid is really very limited so who am i going to look at to say don't look disapprovingly at this because obviously it's not we don't have the richness and the complexity of the data that you would have ideally got to do, to do one of these. Um, but what we've got is what travel cost, the distance they've gone from where they've launched to where to the site they've gone to. We've got the characteristics of the, of, of the site, by which I mean a cell. Does it contain an artificial reef? Does it contain a shipwreck? Does it contain a jetty? Because we've got the coasting, it's what's the area of it. So some of the cells are quite small relative to other ones. And we also found that this distance from the shore, which is we think is a proxy for some sort of ecological or biological um, component, um, that turns up. But we tried lots of other stuff. There was depth. Um, people would tell us that it would also depend upon weather and when they went on the rest of it. Well, I think that just got beyond us in terms of we had to process that for this. Uh, I don't I think they even told us the date where they did the trip, actually, which might have been a problem for that. Um, but what we can do is that we're, we're getting something which says, okay, distance seems to matter, i.e. that obviously they'd rather go closer than further away, and having things in there, the man-made object and our reef ship, which deck of the river, are actually giving an influence, and it seems to be different for the two different groups, the fishers and the divers, and we aggregated the whole lot over all of the, over all of the data. So it's more than just... Um, we did it for all four zones. Um, so we, we, we aggregated. We can do willingness to pays for this, but the willingness to pays come out of this are not very informative. Basically what that says is those are negatives because uh, we're working out what would happen if, it, if there was a loss. And those classic sort of willingness to pay net estimates, which are the ratio of two numbers, the cost to the attribute coefficient, are essentially saying, what's the loss in utility if somebody were to turn up at the site and find that the artificial reef wasn't there. So it's like saying, condition upon you turning up somewhere, what's the change in utility of, of changing the attribute? Which is sort of interesting, but it's not the way the model works. The model's interested in saying, well, if you take the, the attribute out, they won't turn up there. They will reallocate their, their effort around place. They will just go to substitutes. And that's the advantage of using this multiple size cost. Um, so we can we can start playing games. So we're going to just show the geographic. Oh, I've choked two of these. 
So that's sort of the, 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 the region, that's the grids that are going on. Uh, that's the, what's in there, where the things are, the reef and the uh, jetty and shipwrecks and so on are. Um, and then you can start playing games like let's remove an attribute and then see how people reallocate themselves and work out what the total change in consumer surplus is for an average fisher, which is going to depend upon not just the attribute, but where they actually distribute their effort already. So if you remove something which nobody goes to, it's going to have a pretty low impact because they're just not valuing it, it's not changing the, the overall experience. Um, so we can remove buckets and jetties from wreck um, on the Dunsborough artificial reef. And we're sort of seeing losses of what's that about a dollar, um, less than a dollar um, per fisher. That seems small, but remember, if you aggregate this is across everybody, not just people who go there, but you'd have to aggregate it across the complete set of fishing trips that happen in a year across that zone, not just the people who go to the zone, because it's an average for all people. Um, and obviously you're see, seeing differences in, um, in responses. So the divers are preferring, um, or have a bigger, it's a bigger impact if you're removing the swan wreck. People will complain to say, yes, but you shouldn't be fishing on the swan wreck. But remember, this is about removing it from a zone. So, it, it looks as if fishers are gaining some value from having a wreck in a zone. They may be coming up close to the zone where they're allowed to fish. We're not claiming that they're, they're behaving illegally by fishing on the wreck. Open brackets, talk to Johanna. Um, <laughs> but our inference is that, is that having that there may improve the quality of the fishing around it and that they're still getting some benefit from that. So we can play this game. We can start adding things. So we can add a, a, a structure, we can add it close in cell 28 that has a higher value than adding a, cell, uh, adding a structure out of 25, obviously, because the travel costs are getting out there. So even if you put something out in cell 25, not many people are going to bother to go there, so it doesn't get very much value. So we can start to show that you can play these games about allocation. And can you get like aggregate values? Yes, I think we could never managed to find what the total value, the total number of trips were. But if we had a number, which is the number of fishing trips per year in the zone, we could just multiply that by that number. But that, I think we, we asked for that and we've never managed to get an answer for that. They won't give it to us. And we, have, we think that number may exist somewhere. But we haven't managed it. But you could, yeah. Ideally, you would aggregate. There we go. Um, yes, okay. Yes, you can do that. Um, so this is okay. I haven't even talked about this. So this is a high resource, high accuracy, high useful one. So it's sort of at that limit where if, if somebody rocked up and said, Oh, we'd like you to do some work on, we'd sort of our gut reaction would be say, Oh, well, let's go and estimate one of these these locations, these, these uh, travel cost models, um, because you, you can be much more get much more higher quality information out of it. You can deal with all the substitution effects if you're going to put stuff new stuff in or take it out. Uh, but you do need to have it's a much higher resource cost in terms of getting out there, collecting the data, doing the analysis. Okay, on so so this is the one which is up in the north. This is the the nine bits of infrastructure that exist there. Um, it's got pipelines, it's got um, <coughs> the platforms, and there's questions about what you what you do when that needs to be decommissioned. Um, so you could do one thing is that you could convert, leave them where they are, but convert them to artificial reefs. Um, and with the quotes around artificial reefs means, essentially, we're going to treat it as if it's accessible to both divers and fishers. Um, and then and you can see if you do that, the wreck fishers like it, but the divers don't so much. And then we said, well, what happens if you made them into quotes wrecks, which would mean strictly it would it would have some sort of protection around it, which would mean like a wreck, which would mean that the divers would be more protected, still has some value for the fishers, but not as much. So we can play that game. Um, and then, oh, what's the difference between that one and that one? No, um, we can start doing. There isn't any. Perhaps I'm just doing, just stepping through. 
we can start doing things like saying, well, what happens if you do a mixture? Put four artificial reefs in and five reacts in. So these are the total values to the groups of doing all nine in one hit. So we're not doing one by one, we're just saying as a program, bang, in this comes. Um, so you can get, um, a, you, can, you can look to see how the values might change if you do that distribution. You can do, and other little things like what happens if you just put stuff close to the shore and you find, okay, most of the value, surprise, surprise, happens when you actually put stuff close to the shore for the travel costs. Um, so you can start playing those games. So what the advantage of doing this is that potentially you could start saying, what's the optimal composition of this? We haven't done anything here of saying, well, what would happen if you were to pick one of these up and move it somewhere? Mm. Uh, that would be another thing that you could, you could do you can pick it up as in decommission it, clean it, yeah, 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 do it somewhere. Uh, you could do the same thing. Yeah, let's keep going. Echo Yodel. So this was something again which Paul did. So this was there was a particular uh request from um who owns it? Woodside. Woodside, thank you. I'm glad you're here. Uh, you, you can provide facts to my uh <laughs> general thing. Um, so they had a particular interest and said, we'd like to think about this. Um, so um, Todd, uh, there's been ecological surveys sitting on it about what the catch rates are in terms of, because, because there's a bit left of pipe there and it's clear by looking at what the fisher is doing is that they are in some sense targeting it for dropping pots on, which suggests that it has some value because spatially, if, if you can see a reallocation of effort along there, then we're assuming some economic rationality. Um, we assume they're getting some benefit. And in that work, in terms of doing simulated what you might catch, it looks as if there's actually more fish there. So that sort of confirms why you might want to actually, um, why the fishers might well be targeting it. So then the question is, well, what happens if you take it away? So that, they, you know, they could be required to remove it, put the seabed back to its normal. So what we want to do is know about what the loss of profits is. Um, and there's basically one fisher who, who seems to be targeting and using that area. And um, so this is, this is um, an estimate basically by Paul doing some work, um, which, and the issue here is that it's not about the value of the fish that comes off that reef. It's not even the profit for the fish. It's about the substitution possibilities. If that wasn't there, they would reallocate their efforts somewhere else. Presumably they would get less profit, but they would, it's not as if they're going to lose all this activity. Um, so Paul did that, some desktop modeling, uh, that should be a comma, 55,000 a year. Um, which I think was not huge. And in his conversations with people, it's relatively small, as in it's not this, this huge value that, that, um, that initially we thought, oh, this is going to be an interesting one to focus on the commercial fishing guides. Um, that's going to be tick one of our little boxes in our matrix. Actually, it turned out we think it's not massively. Is that because it's more of a fish aggregation thing rather than? Generating it, fish stuff. it seems to be well that that even if it was just an aggregation thing actually that could be really profitable because it just means that you're reducing your cost it's it seems to be more the fact it's intermittent fishing along it mm -hmm. and that there are substitutes which which they can move to quite easily <coughs> How long is <laughs> <laughs> See, I, you should be on the first slide <laughs> um, so yeah and it's small as it's, it's not like a massive it's not Anyway, okay, so that was good. Okay, so you most people have seen this before. Um, so again, in terms of ticking these boxes, filling in the spaces, this wasn't part of the original proposal, um, but we we managed to get Veronica in to get interested in this. Um, and this is about uh, community values. Everything up to now has been about wreck fishers, divers, users of the stuff. And there was just this question, yeah, but what about the general public? Would they be happy to actually see a, ch in, a change in the way that this infrastructure is used, particularly the oil and gas infrastructure, converting oil and gas infrastructure into artificial reefs, which you might think is just, yeah, great, it reduces benefits, um, but is there a social license to actually, for that to happen? And um, do people actually think it's a good idea or is that going to be um, just as an idea, as in sort of the, the language that someone's getting, this is just dumping. 
actually in Europe, it would count as dumping, actually not allowed to create reefs with non-virgin material because it violates the, uh, their rules about dumping, so you're taking existing material. Okay, but it's beautifully designed, it's but there to achieve outcomes. Yes, but can't. So we were interested in seeing whether the public. So um, Veronica was doing this in parallel with us. Um, and you've seen it all. It's a choice experiment, of course, because that's the only way you could possibly answer this question. Uh, and we <laughs> describe different reefs and, and ask people to make choices, what comes out. Um, we were really surprised, as in about, and I think Veronica was a bit surprised at how accepting people were of this pro proposal. Um, a small group who really hated it, but, um, and then some interesting things about, you know, they preferred it when they provided habitats. Um, divers preferred it when divers allowed to access it and so on. So it, it, it gave us some interesting insights really. But it, it allowed us to tick another box, another community, another group in another set, set of assets. Um, okay, take home messages. So we sort of went in, I have to admit, we went in sort of um, broad, and not so shallow, but not deep, as in, uh, given the funding, whatever we had to do this, Johanna for 18 months, I think, at 70%, I asked, well, as in, you could imagine we could have done one of those, hard, you know, in real depth, but we wanted to get, and the advantage of doing that is that we really wanted to have examples in order to illustrate how it could be done, rather than saying, yay, we have found the definitive answer for this value. It was more about saying, if you're going to actually go and do this somewhere, think about these different techniques. Here's a set of techniques that we've worked through and shown you. Um, <coughs> think about what the answer is you want to get out and therefore what, how much investment you want to make as, a, as a, a, an applier of this in terms of getting the outcome. outcome. Um, okay, mm, we'll do this very quickly. We have an interesting problem in terms of integration. And I won't go through this, I think I know I'm time, but you want to ask me questions. But we do have this interesting problem, this question about integrating across the different groups. And what this diagram is trying to show is where the different groups are different colors, green for the economics, orange for the social group. But as in, where were we finding um, issues being raised by, through our techniques? Doesn't mean to say that, that if it's missing, it isn't an issue, but it's just where did we find common, issue, common things turning up? And we still got this question, which we're still working through. Is how do we integrate the fact that we are, are finding, we're all talking about user well-being, for example, we're all finding that's an issue, but we're all defining it in slightly different ways. And how do we bring all this together? Um, so that's still a far beyond them. Does that include non-user well-being as well? Yeah, yeah, as in, yes. So, so it's define it how, so we would define it as, as you know, <coughs> consumer surplus. <surface. coughs> yeah. But, uh, but yeah, um, Carmen will be described, we'll be talking, we're not, probably describing the same thing using different language and different measures. So that's just becomes interesting. Uh, last thing I think, and I will be out. Um, one of the things was this like a communication thing. So one of the outputs of this, it used to be called the cookbook, and it's now become known as the guidebook. Um, it's there's an appendix in the report, and it's an attempt to put a structure on to say, tell us what your question is. And will lead you through as to what techniques you might want to use. And that's being done for all three different approaches, so all the, not just the economic one. But we've tried to set up the guys who wanted this actually wanted a two-pager flow diagram. And we failed miserably to actually we have to get ourselves into that mindset. Um, so I don't know how long it is. It's I think it might be about 30 pages now. That's probably still like it. But they wanted something really sort of clear guidelines, and, and we just struggled with that so hard. But it's, it's basically hopefully going to be a structure to say, these are the different techniques of summary, and this is how they can be applied. And um, so we're hoping that that might be picked up and used. Um, we might need to do some more work in terms of putting it into a nicer format. But okay, mm, gaps, okay, highlights. No, no indigenous values represented in here at all. We didn't acknowledge that, that just was never written in, and there was nobody in the team who had the capacity to do that. Uh, nothing about how things might change over time, nothing about how values might change in terms of decreasing marginal value. Okay, we've got a value for a reef, but when you've got 30 artificial reefs out there, <coughs> is, is the 31st one not 
um, worth anything. So that's what we'd like to, that's something you should you'd like to be able to pick up on. Um, and this idea of using it for spatial allocation, optimizing the sharing, there's clearly are conflicts in terms of use. So could you use this information to try to work out how to do spatial allocation models combined with the accumulation about who should get access to what at different places? Does that include congestion? Yeah, it's, it's, it's part, it's a congestion thing, but it's also just the use it, as in, so talk to Johanna, as in just don't like having, they're, they're diving and all of a sudden they've got fishes coming on top with hooks and weights or whatever, as in it's just pure, some of the uses just aren't consistent with each other. Mm. One's an extractive system, one's a not. So, um, sorry, that was supposed to happen in half an hour, but it's gone over overrun. Which means, fortunately, you can't ask any questions. <laughs> <laughs> so are we going with that, Chumbo? <laughs> Ram, are there people outside the door desperate to get in? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, questions. Oh, God. Am I going to self-manage my questions? Okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to go take it and then. Uh, so the, the echo yodel slide um, talked about the, how there's a relatively small uh, loss that you found with uh, that. Um, I would assume that that the search costs, if like if you were to eliminate that, uh, that the search costs would be fairly small because these fishers would already have other places in mind. So yeah, I think they 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 know their environment, yeah, sure. and what uh, turned up is a new one which they've worked out how to exploit. Yeah. But it's not as if if it disappeared that they're suddenly saying, "Yeah, what do we do now?" As in, so yeah, they're going to be. I think that was the conversation was they were saying, "Okay, it's useful." We're obviously going there, but you know, it's not it's not there the, other, useful other useful places they can go to. You can imagine it could be quite different from other things. There's a red snapper industry in the US, which is like almost have been completely recovered as a result of artificial reefs being put, put in place mm -hmm. in terms of commercial. If you said, okay, if they hadn't done that, what would have happened? That entire industry probably wouldn't be there. Sure. Just depends on which one we've, the, the, the application we've chosen. Okay. Um, did FRDC in general engage with the very um, <laughs> we, 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 uh, uh, we, are, we are awaiting final comments. The report, the report hasn't been finalized yet. Yeah, I'm just like, it's, it's, it should be happening soon. Like your ROM and like the solar survey trip kind of impacts of artificial reefs. And it's all just kind of hand laden, like say, the 300,000 trips a year in that region, 300,000 ish dollars. Um, but yeah, no, no feedback on that. Uh, no, I, no, I think neither positive. We are literally, we are still waiting for. We're in that 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 comfort zone where it's we've submitted the draft, nothing else to do. We're waiting for the comments when there's going to be lots to do. So we're in that nice little zone there where we're relaxing. Yeah. Uh, we'll be interesting to see. Um, they Chevron like the like the. Um, the guide, we have had informal feedback that the guidebook seems to have hit the mark, um, so that's useful. And it, and once it's once we're, it's all approved, it'll all go up on the FRC web, so you get access to everything. It'll all be, you know, it's like there's a 500 page append of appendices to this, and a hundred page report. So there's a lot of information in there, and obviously all the stuff which is coming out of Carmel and um, Grand stuff as well, which is not touched. I've not touched. Dave and then. In the latter couple of years, sort of talk about substitution, but not in the first couple of years. Of that. And I wonder how big an issue it might be. Like, for example, the magic gear has its own special features, but it's in an area where there's other spectacular diving and snorkeling and so on available. And if it wasn't there, people would probably still travel up there for those. Um, and, you know, and you mentioned that I think Paul grabbed a number for elasticity. Yeah. That sounded like it was for the whole industry or the whole yeah. thing, whereas for an individual side, I would have thought it would be the best system to be much higher. Yeah, so um so yeah, that's so that's just that's the, the, the problem of that the or the the consequence of using the Paul approach is that you I think they they searched through all the literature on what the elasticity of demand was for 
yeah. for recreational fishing in general. In general and then they, they trimmed it down to get rid of some of the, 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 the bigger, more unique type activities and up comes a number. And so it's just the benefit. It's like, it's, a, it's not really it's sort of benefit transfer, isn't it? You're pulling across that information. Haven't really estimated. We haven't really estimated the elasticity of demand for it sounds like it fishing. Would overestimate. No. Okay. Uh, because of substitute. Maybe because of substitute. <clears throat> yes. Actually, related to has there been any study that has looked at as you go from large to small? Has there been any study that has looked at as you go from large to small? Has there been any study that has looked at as you go from large to small? Has there been any study that has looked at as you go from large to small? Has there been any study that has looked at as you go from large to small? Has there been any study that has looked at as you go from large to small? Has there been any study that has looked at as you go from large to small? Has there been any study that has looked at as you go from large to small? Has there been any study that has looked at as you go from large to small? Has there been any study that has looked at as you go from large to small? Has there been any study that has looked at as you go from large to small? Has there been any study that has looked at as you go from large to small? Has there been any study that has looked at as you go from large to small? Has there been any study that has looked at So, um, so I, I think it's the pipeline, you don't have to be answering this, or, or, or there's no justification for for leaving it. And, and actually, the, 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 if, if the regulator says you should remove it, you're, you may not have a good case for saying it should stay in because it's got all these extra benefits. So the default setting for infrastructure is it, is it should come out, open brackets, unless you can make a case that safety or environmental benefits or social benefits or something outweighs that, and then we'll look at that. So the consequence of getting a small number might be, well, actually, it's not a huge benefit leaving it there. We'd rather see it come out. Uh, the cost of leaving it. So tell me the something about it, shall we? How expensive is that? What, what uh, okay, so so uh, it's the, the new one that's gone in. So a million dollars of one that's going in just up. Uh, I was reading in the. A million dollars to drop, but that was one I think is a which is the one that's most recently gone in, which I saw being spruced just up the coast. But it sounds if it was entirely made of it was a concrete based one. Swamp. There's been a few. There's the one off Fuji, which was in the last few years, but they're they're a bit different from the pipeline Yeah. In that they're bespoke. Yes. So the one I'm thinking about, it was all concrete and it was all being, they were spooking the fact, oh, this is this has generated lots of jobs because we've been pouring concrete in Jandicott somewhere and we're shipping it out and it's gonna have this fact. But the yeah, the, 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 that infrastructure would be a matter of, is it clean, is it stable? We can leave it there. But the other infrastructure is gonna be a matter of removing it, cleaning it so it's stable and not gonna, and then possibly moving it and putting it somewhere else and possibly adding some bespoke stuff around it as well, or, as in, you and Harvey really likes the idea of just chopping the tops off some of that um, Thethernard infrastructure and just leaving it there because he thinks that it's got such fabulous biodiversity sitting on it at the moment, just mm -hmm. don't mess with it. Mm -hmm. He just thinks that the biodiversity values are so high. I think he wants to put shades on it or something is, is his plan to give it some protection. But, but so ideally what you're gonna do is the next step would be to say, okay, do a proper cost benefit analysis of saying, what are the costs of delivering this relative to the values mm -hmm. we think we're gonna see? But we haven't gone down that route. Uh, the stuff with Abby in in South Australia on the lime, creating the um, limestone um, reef system, the oyster reefs. We did do that cross benefit analysis. But yeah, so ideally that would potentially go into that process. See, uh, no, I'm in a final final three. Question. Well, I just was following up on Dave's question regarding um, this likely to be more of an elastic demand as you go to the broad region of the specific global. But then if that raises the question, has, has there been studies that you know of that have looked at what happens to the system when you change scale? Because if there is something like that, yeah, yeah. It allow you to adjust numbers like I don't know. Top of my head, no. Okay, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much.
sorry for not sustaining my